Welcome to the Unconventional Dyad Podcast, where you'll find broad topics, an unconventional dyad, and one shared goal, educating ourselves through challenging and engaging conversations. Your hosts are Carly and Laura, two graduate students and friends committed to having discussions that are real, raw, and unpolished. Thank you for joining us. everyone. Thank you for tuning in to episode number 10 of the Unconventional Diet Podcast. Today we have a very special guest, Dr. Stephanie Clethermis. We are so excited to uh, get a chance for you guys to hear her, her story and her research. So she is an assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation at UW-Madison. She serves as research director for the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine's Collaborative Research Network, which is housed at UW-Madison. Her background includes expertise in biostatistics and research methods. Her research focuses on the application of statistical methodology and design to sports medicine topics. We discussed a wide range of topics today on the podcast. Uh, more specifically, we talked about Dr. Clethermis' work with young female athletes and how athletics may allow young girls to develop a sense of identity and a sense of belonging. We also talked about individuals who do not have the financial resources to access athletics and the sports specialization that many more privileged athletes are provided. Um, another topic of discussion included the importance of encouraging exercise in young kids as a way to improve physical and mental health the way in which COVID has impacted athletes and their mental health and well-being. And we also talked about imposter syndrome and the way in which Dr. Klee Thermos overcame her feelings of insecurity. Dr. Klee Thermos made a really important point at the mm -hmm. end of the episode, which doesn't necessarily show up in the audio, but she talked about life being a marathon and not a sprint. Um, so she really encourages people to not look ahead at the finish line, but to keep putting one foot in front of the other, um, and drawing on the help and connection to others. Steph, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm so delighted to get a chance to speak with you. It's been a, a long time since we've last spoken. Before we get started, do you want to share with our listeners, kind of who you are, um, how you identify, what you do for work? Sure. Yeah. So first of all, thank you, Carly and Laura, for having me. I'm so excited to talk with you today. Um, how do I identify? That's such a big question. I think we identify in so many ways from our personal life and our professional life. So certainly I can talk a little bit about both. Um, professionally, I am a biostatistician. So I got my PhD in biostatistics in 2013 from the University of Iowa. And that path has taken me, uh, that or that degree has taken me into, into so many different given me so many opportunities and, and opened up so many doors for me in ways that I never could envision. So right now, I am in Madison, Wisconsin, and I'm a, an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, in the Department of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation. And primarily uh, within that department, I'm in the sports medicine division. And I do sports medicine research with investigators within uh, our department. And I, I work in various labs uh, I, or I interact with various labs. So I, I work with a team of investigators that do a lot of biomechanics research, specifically on runners and our division one athletes here at UW. Um, I also work with another investigator here on campus who does a lot of research with youth sports and interacts with high schoolers across the state. And so we do quite a bit of research on, on high school athletes across the state. Um, but I also, what's very unique about my position is that I serve as research director for a national organization. So the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine, which I will use as its acronym, AMSSM. Uh, I serve as their research director. So they actually buy out most of my time at the university so that I can uh, help develop their research initiatives and kind of oversee that. And one of our biggest initiatives is the development of what we call our Collaborative Research Network or our CRN. And it's a network, a national network that 
we've developed with this organization to really foster sports medicine research, uh, collaborative research to try and improve the practice of sports medicine. And that looks so different in so, in, in so many different ways. Uh, there's so many topics to sports medicine and we can get into that. So that's kind of my professional hat that I wear, a very unique role as an academic and a biostatistician, but one that certainly fits me. And, and as I talk to you about my, my personal identity, I think you'll see why that fits. So. I personally, I have been a very active person uh, as, for my entire life. I was an athlete growing up. I played three sports at Lawrence University where Carly and I met, and I still continue to be active. And to this day, I, I no longer am participating in team sports to the degree I did at, at Lawrence, but I'm now a marathon runner. Um, so I transitioned from a sprinter and a jumper as a track athlete to now this endurance world, which has been great and a new challenge for me. And I also coach, uh, I, I used to coach youth basketball, youth girls basketball, which I absolutely loved. Um, I've since given that up, but I do still coach Girls on the Run, our local chapter of Girls on the Run, which is just a wonderful organization that um, really promotes healthy lifestyle and, and self-confidence and esteem for, for young girls kind of through running. And so that's a really big part of my current identity as, as kind of a volunteer and a coach. Your journey into your career is, is fascinating to me. You started out as an athlete growing up. You were also an athlete at Lawrence, and now you are working with athletes, and you still maintain kind of the identity as an athlete, as a marathon runner. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about how those are all intertwined? Yeah. Uh, at least how you see them being so intertwined. Yeah. You know, there's so much to the world of athletics that really just speaks to life in general. And I'm, I'm so grateful for the experiences I've had because we all hear about the benefits of, of sport, right? So we know that you learn how to be gracious in defeat and kind of humble in victory as a young kid while learning the fundamentals of sport and you kind of continue to learn things like teamwork and resiliency and perseverance and determination while growing up. So there are all these valuable life lessons that you learn through sport. But what's really, really neat for me, and especially as a collegiate athlete, and Carly, I think you can really relate to this, is that life is a series of lessons, right? And so you learn and you relearn lessons over and over again. And What's really neat about the lessons you learn through sport, especially as a collegiate athlete, is that we rarely talk about the importance of relearning those lessons uh, in new and different ways as young adults and even as young professionals. So to have the opportunity to relearn things like teamwork and communication and resiliency and how to fail gracefully as a young adult and as a collegiate athlete at a time where you're really trying to figure out who you are and what path you want to take in your life. You know, you're really starting to make those decisions for yourself while participating in sport and kind of going through those same lessons. I think that was just an incredible gift for me. And so I was honing these skills as an athlete, certainly through my life, but specifically in college at a time where I was really in control of my own life. Uh, and that has just really continued to flourish and help me then be successful in my career as an adult today. That's incredible. I, I'm thinking a little bit about your work with young girls. And I, I don't know exactly where this question is going to take us, but can you share a little bit about how you work with young girls yeah. and really what the goals are working with young girls in in athletics? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I got involved specifically with Girls on the Run. I heard about it when I was a first, my first year in graduate school in Iowa City. So way back in 2007, I, I heard about this program and it just spoke to me so deeply because I just feel like it's those lessons I kind of talked about that I learned in sport. I was no longer in sport at that point, right? My, my career had kind of come to an end. And so I was trying to find ways to stay connected to sport because that was such a big part of my identity. So to go from a, an undergrad who was playing sports, three sports a year to go to graduate school where I had nothing, that was a big change for me. And that was hard. And uh, I felt a, a sense of loss of my identity. So I was seeking ways in which I could continue to be 
part of sport. And, and at that point, I really realized it was now my time to give back to sport. So to give back what I had received from my participation in sport. And so Girls on the Run is just this amazing program that really focuses on teaching those types of lessons to young girls and really fostering and developing that strength and that courage and just that independence that I learned through athletics kind of tangentially and not as direct as Girls on the Run does as a program. Um, but really, that's where I got started in this. And it has just grown from there. So I, I, I work with these young girls and I go there and my role as a, as a volunteer coach is to inspire them and to really mentor them and, and help them be the best they can be and, and see their their kind of potential. But it's amazing how they give back just back to you. And so it's, it's continually, I, I'm learning through sport. And it's amazing because these girls just teach you how to live in the moment and, and to really take each day as it comes. And so I, I really go to inspire them. But in the end of the day, they inspire me. And, and so that's one, one way in which I, I think that I, I, my interaction with kids and why that's so important to me, but also you know, when I was coaching uh, youth basketball, so I, before I, I came to Madison, I right out of college or graduate school, I had a more of a traditional appointment at the University of Loyola in, in Chicago, and I was just in a traditional biostats kind of department. And that at that time, I was coaching uh, fourth and fifth grade girls basketball. And again, I was volunteering. And, and the reason why I did so was because I saw a need for qualified coaches to teach these girls proper fundamentals in youth sport, I feel like they kind of get left behind uh, because I, I think in different ways that, that females and girls deal than with them boys um, who have these opportunities and co these coaches who, who can develop the, to develop them. I think working with young girls is very different and there's a, a, a big importance or there's an, it's important to help them develop fundamentals at a young age. And they don't always get that because they get dads who watch sports and like sports, but not who really know how to develop those fundamental skills. And, and so again, to help girls succeed and to continue on in sport and stay active, which is just so important to me. And it's something I'm very passionate about is helping girls continue to stay active. Uh, I felt like that was my duty as, as a former athlete is to give back in that way as someone who's qualified and knows the fundamentals of sport, of that sport to teach them. And so that in a way that they will find it fun and that it's uh, not too competitive and not demeaning for them, but, but also teaches them what they need to know so they can succeed at each level as they desire. You've touched on this a little bit already, but I'm curious about some of the specific challenges that you've noticed in working with female athletes and maybe young girls more specifically. Yeah, I know that I think that what you see in young girls and it, and it translates, I think, to the professional world for me as an adult is a lack of confidence, right? And and so especially as they're growing and they're going, uh, progressing into puberty and beyond, as their body changes, uh, girls, they, they lack that confidence that they can succeed. And especially if maybe they saw some early success and then they are trying to deal with their growing bodies, um, they feel this pressure. They feel external pressure from others um, to be the best at that sport or whatever it may be. And, and what we know is that girls drop out of sports uh, at almost twice the rate of, of boys by the time they're in high school. And that's a really scary thing because we also know that sports, uh, if you're active as a kid, you're more likely to be active as an adult. And, and there's so much positive uh at ramifications and outcomes from being a physically active adult, right? Mental and physical uh, and, and just your, your overall well-being and that you don't have to be the world's best athlete to, to be an active adult. And so that's really alarming to me um, as it with these with these girls is that they lack this confidence and they lack uh, the self esteem. And so then they stop being physically active, they don't think they can do it. And so uh, I, I really do worry about that. And, and that's where you also potentially start to see some of these mental challenges and that the girls um, start to have eating disorders and some 
Um, and I think it, it really stems from this, this insecurity. And, and I'll bring that full circle why I think Girls on the Run is such a powerful and impactful program and why I'm so deeply invested in it is it because it teaches them that we're all unique and we're all different and that's okay, right? So how do you build their confidence? Are there like specific strategies you use? Or- yeah, so um, it's certainly just one of the, one, I think one of the best strategies is just showing you authentically who you are to them, right? So showing them that here I am as a strong, independent woman um, and I and successful woman and that they can be that too, right? But the program, Girls on the Run, it has a, a well-developed curriculum that we follow and it has a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy techniques in there and, and lessons that we teach the girls. And so like, for example, this afternoon, our, so we have a topic every day. This afternoon, we're gonna be talking about empathy. Um, uh, last uh, on Tuesday, we talked about stopping and taking a breather. And so we were teaching the girls about if they have these uncomfortable emotions, how do they how do they handle them? Right. And so there are all these little things that we really kind of unpack with them in fun ways through running and activities that they they're learning things that they don't necessarily know they're learning. But when you hear from them 10 years later and they say, wow, Girls on the Run really taught me how to work through some of those issues and, and really kind of stand on my own feet in that way. That is just incredible work. I, I find it really intriguing that you in fact, integrate some psychology into the work that you do. And this, I mean, both Laura and I are training to be psychologists. And I think it's just really, um, it's, it's great that you're integrating Mm -hmm. those uh, kind of interventions with the work Mm -hmm. that you do with with young women and girls. Um, Can you share a little bit about your own personal journey into running? Um, I, I, I'm reflecting back to the Boston Marathon, the one that got mm-hmm. canceled. And um, that's been on my mind a lot, Steph. And I, I don't really know why, but I just feel, I felt really, um, really sad that it ended up getting canceled. Um, yeah. Can you share a little bit about your journey into into running and kind of your personal journey into Yeah, it? for sure, Carly. So I was one of those people that was supposed to run the Boston Marathon in April and, and it got canceled. And so, but let me backtrack a little bit. Uh, running has turned into such a vital part of my life, and I never thought that it would have. So like I alluded to earlier in college, I was a sprinter and a jumper, and I used to complain to my coach when she would make us run a mile cool down. I said, I, I don't run more than 400 meters around a track. Why are you making me run a mile cool down? And, um, and that was all kind of in jest, but there was truth to that too. I was never very interested in that long distance running. But again, when I got to graduate school, I was looking for this outlet. I was looking for new ways to challenge myself. And so I went to this activity fair and just, it was a phys- at the at our field house and I was walking around and I got pulled in when somebody started talking to me and he happened to be with, um, the, it's called Dance Marathon, and the Dance Marathon occurs at all the at a lot of universities, and they they raise money for the Children's Hospital by running this of uh, having this twenty four hour event where you attend, you raise money for this event, and you dance and all night long, essentially, you don't go to sleep for 24 hours. But there was a spinoff of that called Dance Marathon, the Marathon, and they got people to sign up to run the Chicago Marathon and raise money for the for the Children's Hospital. And so that was how I got introduced to long distance running. It was something that I thought was a great cause and was going to be a new challenge for me, a a way for me to meet people outside of my program, biostatistics program at the time. And, and so I signed up on a whim and running has now been a part of my life ever since. I could not, I could not have imagined the positive effect it would have had on me. It's, it, I've met people, um, just the, the energy it gives me to have that be part of my daily routine of running uh, and kind of the mental release. I, I often joke that running was what got me through my PhD because I would be trying to figure out problem uh, as I was trying to code a biostatistics thing and I would go for a run and all of a sudden I would figure it out right so that running has the ability to do that but uh, so it it really has had a a tremendous uh, mental and physical implications in my personal life and 
you know, thinking a lot about Boston, that was always my goal was to, was to get to the Boston Marathon. And I've been fortunate enough to, to run it numerous times now. And, uh, and, you know, thinking about it being canceled this year, it was is really quite interesting for me. I, I kind of knew working in the medical sports medicine world that that was going to happen kind of before it happened. I just knew there was no way we could safely run this marathon. And I still question whether we're going to be able to run it safely even next spring. I, I have high doubts about that. But um, so I was almost preparing myself for it being canceled. And, and I think I, I was okay with that. But I felt for people who work so hard to get to that point, and then not to be able to reap the reward. But for me, running, training for the marathons has become the reward and kind of the running of the marathon has been the icing on the cake. And so I saw the running community come together in so many unique and fun ways uh, after the cancellation of the marathon. And just we've been supporting each other in new ways. I think I think this is true of a lot of people in a lot of areas from this due to this pandemic is we've lost interest in some things that we know we love to do. And, and I'm not entirely sure why that is, but I think we're just dealing with so much stress and so much unknown that what we really love has just kind of fallen away. And, and for me, that was running. I have not run as much as I normally do throughout the year. And, and I haven't been motivated to do it. And I was wondering, well, is it because there are no races? And I don't think that is because when I go out for a run, I still reap those benefits and I still feel the positive effects of running on my life. But it's just the heaviness that I think we're all dealing with. And, and I've heard that in other ways, you know, people don't feel like um, cooking or, you know, doing things that they love to do uh, because they're dealing with just this, this heaviness. And so I, I think that that's, um, that's been an unfortunate side effect of this pandemic, but and it's it's really been it's hit the running community hard. But we've also been creative and found ways to do virtual events and to stay connected in in new ways. And so I think that's been really exciting to see kind of what's possible out of challenging situations. On a similar note, I'm wondering if you've been experiencing something similarly with the athletes that you work with? Um, you know, I know that, you know, sports are starting to get back into the swing of things, but there are still several barriers mm -hmm. in the way. How do you see that playing out with collegiate athletes now, the pandemic and really how they're um, kind of coping okay. with not being able yeah, to play? Yeah, so I, I can't speak directly about the athletes themselves because I haven't really had contact with them as much as our sports medicine physicians have who have direct contact with them. But Certainly, this is challenging. I, going back to that idea of your identity as an athlete and the inability to have a sports season and that, that unknown, I think, has been really challenging. I think there's um, some concern, some great concern within the, the sports medicine community about potential mental and psychological ramifications of this, and as well as physical in terms of, you know, we have our football players gearing up now to start a season, and they've come, they're coming in very under prepared because they didn't have spring football or summer training in the way that they're used to having. And so there's some concern about injuries that we're seeing even in the professional level right now due to under training and not being prepared. But uh, I can tell you briefly about a study we did this summer on, on our high school athletes. We we did a, a survey on high school athletes in Wisconsin, and then we expanded it nationally. And it was really looking at the effects of the pandemic uh, on canceled sports seasons uh, and canceled sports seasons and what that looked like for high school athletes in terms of their physical activity levels and their anxiety and depression symptoms. Um, and what we found was really uh, not surprising, but, but really some shocking numbers and the the physical activity numbers just plummeted. So kids were not being physically active. This We took the, we administered the survey in May. So it was still pretty new. But we saw um, a, a really sharp increase in the symptomology of uh, the number of uh, depression and anxiety symptoms among our high school athletes. And we saw that in Wisconsin. And we also saw that that, that same thing nationally. And, and concerningly, we saw that disproportionately among our low poverty or, or low SES status um, athletes who just don't have the opportunities or resources that potentially some of the other athletes did. So there's certainly been some concern 
uh, related to that uh, that we're very well aware of. I'm wondering if you have any tips or advice for people who are trying to maintain their physical activity during yeah. the pandemic, whether that's, you know, high school students or even adults. Yeah, so I, I think it, you just need to try and schedule it as part of your day and, and know that you don't have to go as intense as you maybe once did. So for me, I've been loving just going out for walks. You know, if I don't have the motivation to go for a run, I may just go out for a walk or go out for a bike ride. And that's been really important. And, you know, you used to do these eight to 10 mile runs on a daily basis. And now just going out for a five mile run or just getting out for 30 minutes and doing some sort of physical activity, I think is, is really a good place to start. And for me, it's I've really had to try and schedule it into my day as almost as if it was a meeting that I have um, to make sure that that I do that and just take that time for myself to make it happen. But just not put pressure on yourself to to do what maybe you you would typically do. I and mean, gyms are closed, and obviously, you know, I used to I play on a just a rec volleyball team, and we haven't done that since March. And um, so, just trying to find different ways to be physically active and broadening your definition of what it means to exercise. So for me, I always felt like I had to get in a hard workout as a runner uh, to have exercise, but that's not true. Like you can get the same effects and positive outcomes of just by just going for a walk or being in nature, or hiking, you know, there's so many different ways you that or just gardening in your yard, whatever that may be, just making sure that you're, you're moving your body in some way every day, I think is really important. I have so many questions for you. Um, and I, I know we are a little bit limited on time. I I am curious about your your research. Can you share a little bit about research that you've been doing over the last few years and, and really what that looks yeah, like? Yeah, so in my role as research director for AMSSM, I really oversee a lot of different research, which is kind of fun. And, and also as a biostatistician, there's a famous saying within our community that um, we get to play in everybody else's backyard, which is so cool. And it, it's so true. And so, you know, we do, I, I've been involved in research projects for uh, looking at related to concussion and, you know, related to baby bone stress injuries in runners. Um, I My favorite and kind of where I'm trying to develop my area of expertise is a new sport specialization. So kids who specialize in one sport at a very young age. And that's been a, an increasing trend we've seen over the past decade. I'm so fortunate. I consider myself very lucky that I was not part of that, that I could be a multiple sport athlete for many years. And there's so much benefit to that. And there's a lot of risk that we're seeing associated with single sport athletes that specialize in one sport, particularly related to injury risk, that their injury risk increases, specifically overuse injuries, um, and also some potential burnout that they they just are playing one sport year round and traveling and so much training for that sport that they just get burned out and they don't want to do it anymore. Um, and that has some potential problems as well. So that's really an area that I've fallen just in love with because I feel so passionate and so grateful for my own experience as being a multiple sport athlete. And I see this trend, that, this concerning trend towards that. And what we, um, what we do know is that kids who specialize versus kids who don't specialize, now there's both paths can get you to the elite level of success, however you define that, whether that being collegiate athletics, but whether that's the Olympics or professional athletes, both paths are successful so that you don't need to specialize in order to become a professional athlete. And I think that that's a really important statement because a lot of the reasons why kids specialize is they think they need to, to be able to get a college scholarship. And, and that's not true. And we're actually seeing some evidence that skills are transferable across sports. And it may not be the sport specific skills, but your ability to see fields and, and really to develop new skills uh, may, may be transferable across sports, which really kind of goes against that argument of, um, of single sport specialization. 
So, and, and certainly this summer, we've done a lot with COVID. And right now we're, we're working on a big project. We're launching a, a national cardiac registry for athletes who have been diagnosed with COVID because there are some concerns of myocarditis, which is heart inflammation uh, in athletes who, who have been diagnosed. And typically if you're diagnosed with myocarditis, that's a minimum of three to six months away from sport. And so it, it is a big deal and we don't have answers. And so I'm working with some investigators uh, at Harvard and University of Washington, Seattle, to put together a, a large registry to start answering some of these really important clinical questions related to, to COVID-19 and the current pandemic so that we can keep athletes safe. And, and more importantly, not just athletes, but active people who may also be diagnosed with COVID and have better understanding of how this virus is affecting uh, our cardiovascular systems. So, so that's a very exciting and, and busy initiative we're working on right now. I'm wondering about this sports specialization. Um, so I, I grew up in a really rural area and we didn't have the opportunity to specialize in any one sport. We were playing, most of us were playing at least two or three, if not more. I'm wondering if you have an idea of what athletes specialize. Is there any kind of uh, indicators of what athletes you find. Yeah, it's a great question. In, in any particular sport. So we see, so you're exactly right, in the more rural areas where you don't have the opportunity to specialize because your high school needs you to play all the sports, we don't see that as much. But unfortunately, where we are seeing this is uh, where athletes who have and families who have the ability to pay to become specialized athletes. So there's this pay to play model where it, if your family can afford you to be on this elite travel squad or this you know regional team, then those are the athletes who are traveling to these regional or national showcases so that they can get exposure at uh, by, you know, scouts at various levels. And uh, so we do see this disparity in, in those kids who are, are specializing. Um, I think it's happening in in all sports to some degree. And some sports, which is are interesting, is there may be some benefit to specialization. So some of these sports like gymnastics, where you peak at an earlier age, there may be, and your skill development development needs to happen at an earlier age, there may be some benefit to actually specializing. And we're still trying to tease out these sports specific effects of specialization. It's a very young field that continues to grow. Um, and that's one area that we just don't have a lot of sports specific, but we know, for example, in Wisconsin, soccer, hockey, these are, these are sports where kids are specializing. If you go down south, it's baseball, it's softball, because they can play year round. Um, in Chicago area, it was volleyball. Volleyball is, is increasingly becoming a sport where, where girls specialize and play year round. And so, um, so we're, we're seeing that kind of all across the board, not necessarily in any specific sport, it, but it does regionally matters. And certainly your, your family means matter as well. It is a bit reassuring um, that you share that the if you were to specialize, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be better off. I, I find that a little bit reassuring, especially for those individuals who don't have the capacity to, to pay for these more specialized um, programs, trainings, um, this travel, right. travel ball, essentially. And I, I do find that reassuring, but it is still really really unfortunate that those individuals don't have the capacity to go out and do right. travel leagues. I it's, it's, can you, can you share a little bit more about um, kind of the issue with that? I don't have. A, yeah, I don't no, have a I, I, think I, like I think I can. I think I know what you're getting at. So I don't know if you both are familiar with the national youth sports strategy, but it was recently put out by mm -hmm. president's uh, council for sports, fitness and nutrition, or they're affiliated with it in the office of, disease prevention and health promotion. I get that office mixed up all the time, but the government put this national youth sports strategy out and it's really geared to trying to get more kids active at a younger age. And because we, we're dealing with issues of obesity and pediatric obesity and, you know, mental health issues. And we know that physical activity 
helps to address some of those issues. And, and so some of the concerns are that kids are, are in these environments or in these locations where they don't have access to sport or they don't have access to safe ways, parks where they can go gather with their friends and play basketball or baseball, that, that those opportunities don't exist equally across the board. And this is a really big national problem. I would consider it a public health emergency, right? That we need to be able to get kids equal opportunity uh, to be able to participate in sports because we know the profound effects that sports and physical activity have, not only in their development as kids, but progressing into opportunities as adults. And so I, I do think there's some concern with the sports specialization that that is almost impeding what we're trying to do and broaden um, the opportunities in sport. And one really cool thing that came out, so the Healthy People uh, 2030 initiative just recently came out. And one of their goals is to increase the proportion of kids who are participating in sport. And they're just trying to move the needle just a little bit, but I think it's so important and be, and it's the first time this has been in one of those Healthy People initiatives that they've included this, but they realize the importance and the possibilities uh, that are afforded to kids if they are participating in sport. And we we just need to kind of continue promoting that. And that's really what Amos SM and sports medicine physicians care about. They don't care about getting the athletes to the Olympic level. They care about getting athletes active so that they are active as adults and stay healthy and all and, and caring for the, the entire athlete, being their psychosocial well-being as well as their physical and spiritual health, you know, all of that. So yeah. On the flip side of what we've been talking about is really kind of the the darker side of athletics. Um, I'm wondering what you've seen in terms of kind of this darker side, the flip side of athletics, whether it's eating disorders, whether it's um, injuries. Can you share a little yeah. bit about kind of the other side of Okay, yeah, you're absolutely about. right. We don't often talk about it, but we know it exists, right? We see suicides in athletes. Um, we see eating disorders. We see sexual violence happening in athletes. We see um, abuse and, or substance abuse. Uh, there, there are a lot of issues that we see in athletics, and you're right, we don't talk about it. And and really, I think we're from a research perspective, we are just trying to start to address it in, in recent years. Um, so there are efforts underway to, to better understand these and how we can help athletes and, and kids really address these issues. Um, so I, I can't speak too much about, you know, what, what we know, because the, the reality is we don't know much. I can certainly speak anecdotally for myself. I was very fortunate to be a very healthy athlete. And I, again, I'm going to attribute that to being a multiple sport athlete, but I really wasn't injured all that much. Um, and you maybe had a sprained ankle here or there, but I never had any serious injuries. But in college, my junior year of college, I uh, went through a really dark period. I had brought, I got had bronchitis, and then I came back from bronchitis, and all of a sudden, I was struggling to breathe. I couldn't breathe in ways that I typically could breathe, and it took me about four months to be diagnosed with exercise-induced asthma, and so that was a result of that, and I was out of bas my basketball season. I was out of the first half of my track season, and it was a really dark time for me. I was not participating in sport. Um, I was not cleared to participate. I was going through all of these, having all these tests conducted and nothing, um, nothing was coming back. And finally, I was diagnosed with exercise induced asthma. And that, um, and, and that was kind of a, a big win for me. But that was a very dark period of my athletic career, because my, my friends, my teammates were competing, and I was sidelined. And mentally, that was a very challenging time for me. And I was grateful to have support of coaches and friends and, and uh, that were really kind of picking me up during that time. But I, I totally understand what that could feel like for an athlete who may have a se severe injury and potentially career ending injury. And we don't, we don't address those issues, you know? So, um, 
it's something that we need to become more comfortable talking about and, and certainly researching. And I have some colleagues here at, at the University of Wisconsin who are very interested in, in researching some of those like career ending injuries and what are the effects, psychosocial effects of that. Um, and AMSSM is doing quite a bit of work in the sexual violence world right now. So, so lots of good stuff happening, but uh, you're right. We just, we don't have, we're not where we need to be in regards to that. I'm wondering if we can shift gears a little bit. Um, there was something you mentioned in one of your emails about imposter syndrome, and I've just been super curious about that ever since I read that email. Um, I'm wondering how you've seen imposter syndrome show up in your work, whether you know your own personal work, your professional work. Yeah, like so I'll, pick, I'll speak to that. I think to, from just me personally, I think we all – have a certain sense or degree of imposter syndrome. And, and I felt that quite a bit in graduate school uh, as a biostatistician, because I think there are two different, there are two different types of biostatisticians. There's those who are very theoretical minded and those who are very applied. And I am a very applied biostatistician. And um, but a lot of my friends and, and classmates were very good at the theory. And, and in many ways, I really struggled and I didn't think I could complete my PhD because of it. Uh, and it took a lot of kind of outside encouragement from my professors and to, to say, no, we need people like you in here. Um, so that's where I, my first kind of foray and experience with, with imposter syndrome started. But in this role as research director, I, it, it creeps up quite a bit because I am a young professional and I'm often working with really established uh, individuals who have really proven themselves in the field of sports medicine. And, you know, when I'm talking with various directors of national governing bodies or at the NIH or, um, you know, talking to the chief medical officer of the, uh, the uh, USOPC, I just... I, I do get a little bit like, I'm not sure if I deserve to be in this room with you. I, I'm young. And, um, and so that's been, that's certainly a challenge and a struggle that I have from time to time. And, and also just as a biostatistician in the sports medicine world. So I, I'm part of this organization and they're all clinicians and very clinically minded and I'm a, a researcher, right? So my expertise and experience is in methodological approaches and, really trying to, to keep up with them clinically is, oh, is sometimes challenging. And, and I wonder, am I, am I carrying my weight? Am I, am I an important part of this team? And certainly when I take a step back, I realize, yes, you know, and the lessons again that you learn in sport that we all have a role to play on a team, right? So in volleyball, I was a libero. I was never in the front row blocking or spiking or, you know, hitting or setting. And the success of the team would not be possible if I was not in that role. Um, and, and vice versa, I would not see success if, my, if I didn't have my teammates surrounded by me. And so I think that's been a very important teacher for me is just to remind myself that um, we're all going to make mistakes and that's okay. And the lessons you learn in, in sport is that, um, you, you know, you learn to try and fail and then to try again and, and to, and you fought, you plot paths forward and it's okay to fail in sport it makes me realize it's okay to make mistakes in my professional life and to not know everything and not to be, you know, and to rely on other people in, when I need when I need that. So that's been um, that's something I'm not afraid to talk about. And I share quite a bit with young professionals who are just starting out saying, you know, this is real. And I think we do all deal with it to some degree. Yeah, I yeah. Can definitely personally relate to that for sure. Being in graduate school, I think it's something I've struggled with myself. Um, I have thought a little bit about maybe some of the upsides of imposter syndrome, like that perhaps there are some positive sides to it. I wonder if you've seen. That yeah, well, I think, you know, I think the positive for imposter syndrome for me is that you really just learn to work through your insecurities and to not shy away from it. Right. So I think that what we learn is that 
we cannot try, we may, we can always avoid failure by not trying something, right? But if we do that, then we don't succeed, we don't win. And I think that's where um, that, that has really been a positive for me to really realize if I'm gonna push, if I'm gonna overcome this imposter syndrome, then I really need to take that risk or, or be courageous to actually take that, that next step and be willing to fail and be willing to make mistakes. And, you know, as an athlete, I think we all, want to be perfect. You know, we, we have this drive for perfection and we know it's unattainable, but at the same time, uh, we continue to strive for it. And I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing because I do think that challenges us and pushes us to new heights, uh, even though we know we're never going to achieve perspe- uh, perfection. And I think that that's all kind of interrelated with this idea of um, imposter syndrome and just trying to be the best you can be and knowing that that's enough and your best may not be the best of the person sitting next to you. And that's, that's all okay. Steph, I do have to ask about your experience with imposter syndrome in your statistics program. Um, I, I I don't know if you know this about me, but I was doing um, not only a PhD, but concurrently doing a master's in applied statistics kind of, kind of parallel with one another and um at my program i was one of the only women um in that program in statistics and i felt an incredible amount of imposter syndrome and i actually just Mm -hmm. ended up getting a phd minor because i couldn't handle it and i'm wondering if you experienced something similar similarly being maybe one of the only few women in the program. Yeah, no, Carly, I'm sorry you had that experience. And I didn't know that about you, but that's, that's that we have that connection. I, uh, yes, so I, I'm certainly in two kind of male dominated fields, right, in, in statistics, as well as in sports medicine. And that, that was often a challenge for me when I was at uh, the University of Iowa in the biostats program. At one point, the program got down to just one female professor. And and I'm so grateful for for that department because I think our male professors there recognize that and recognize the problem with that and have really worked hard over the past really eight years, eight to 10 years to really try and rectify that. But that's challenging in and of itself, too, because, you know, one female professor may not want to come into a male dominated department. They may feel those that sense of of imposter syndrome. So really um, how I got through that, I relied on my undergraduate advisor quite heavily. Um, And so I found mentors outside of my own circle within graduate school that was helpful. But I also really realized that males can be really great allies as well, you know, and so you don't, it doesn't have to be somebody who is exactly like you and looks like you and thinks like you that uh, as long as you can find people who are in your corner and willing to help advocate for you and lift up your voice when you're trying to to make a point or make a statement and we'll, we'll really have your back in that regard. Uh, I found that to be much more important than um, what my what you know what my mentor may may or may not look like and I think that expands not only to gender differences but racial differences, all sorts of, of diversity and background issues that you really just need to find those people who are going to accept you for who you are, going to see you for who you are and not who they want you to be and um, will really just be in your corner when, when you need them. Mm-hmm. It's so interesting because I'm reflecting on this more now. Um, I have really kind of felt very comfortable with people who see me as, as kind of more of my ideas and mm-hmm. really what I have to offer rather than my gender. Um, there was a drastic shift in, um, I was really fortunate. My PhD advisor saw me that way, very much kind of curious about my ideas and not so much my, my gender. Yeah. And I think that yeah. And, that's that just, really and, and I don't want to maybe, I don't want to downplay the fact that I do think we need to make sure that there is balance because we need these different perspectives and we need people to be able to see themselves, um, in other professionals and, and to help them kind of build their courage and, and really believe that they can aspire to be what they want to be. Um, and so I, I do really feel very strongly that we continue to work towards that. And I feel, again, very fortunate that the organizations I am a part of right now are, are really at the, of the forefront of that, of really trying to make sure that those changes happen and that we're very apparent, uh, uh, you know, and as we're putting together organizations and leadership teams and uh, different conferences that we're making sure that there is uh, 
representation from from all groups because I think that just enhances the final product so much and it just makes us it just makes everything more rich so yeah so we're getting to the end of the episode and um, we ask all of our guests this question and I know it's a big one but can you reflect back over the last um, seven months year um, and can you think of one thing that you've really learned about yourself and how you envision that playing out? Yeah, I love that question, Carly. Um, and I'm going to go back to something I said earlier that, you know, we learn these lessons throughout life and then we relearn them again. And this year has been just uh, a, a just a, a great opportunity for me to relearn many important uh, lessons. And I think the biggest one for me was is more of a personal one. It's the, the importance of connection and community in my life. And, uh, you know, you, you can sometimes take that for granted. But when I hit March and everything was stripped away from me, uh, that was really hard. My communities and the areas in which I identified just kind of went away. It was such a, a just a kind of out of body experience. And, um, and so that was a really hard, those first few months are really hard. And I've had to then work to, to really kind of reimagine what connection looks like with each of my communities and make sure that I make that a priority. Because um, if not, I know I'm not at my best. And I'm not, if I'm not giving my best, then it just kind of that trickle effect for those around me as well. And so this idea and the importance of we're in this together, you know, and this is a, a community and um, that we, we need to just continue to connect with people in really meaningful, authentic ways, not the superficial, how are you, but the really, how are you, you know, um, it, it, I think that that has been a, a really important thing for me. So I've been really trying to, to make sure I check in on those that I, that I care about and that I love as much as they are checking in on me as well. Mm -hmm. that's beautiful yeah we we really want to thank you for your time Steph I personally for me this has been so eye-opening I mean I didn't I honestly didn't expect this conversation to be this inspiring to me um not because I wasn't expecting great things but it's just it's made me think about my own relationship with exercise so differently I grew up kind of with this attitude that sports are for boys I was never really encouraged to go into them. I was actually kind of discouraged from going into athletics. Um, I only got into exercise when I was in college. And I'm just really rethinking everything I've thought about exercise. Uh, thanks oh, thanks, Laura. That's very kind of so you. Thank you so much. This episode of the Unconventional Diet Podcast is sponsored by Anchor. Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. The most important thing about Anchor is that it's free. They also have creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started.